All right. <clears throat> so what did you think of that whole Mexican uh, E.T.? We found E.T., to, but he didn't make it to phone home. Uh, literally, uh, it looks like a mummified or like from the movie E.T. I, I don't know. That's exactly what I thought when I seen the inexcusably low resolution video considering that it's 2023 i thought why are we looking at something that looks like it's in 480p i just don't get why they can't afford better cameras there i mean it's literally the congress of mexico right very important position but uh, whatever whatever the case was uh when i looked at the the figures i thought the same thing that you did looked like et the facial shape anyways Right, so, like mi- missing the big, like the the flesh, uh, you know, just like the eroded. Oh man, the. E. I but mean, I were they supposed to be fossilized bodies? Do you oh. believe so? Yes, fossilized or mummified or something in they, between. They said they. Probably it said it, it was years. not mummified. Wasn't mummified. Okay, maybe. Yeah. I think all they meant by that was it didn't go through the process of mummification. That it was somehow preserved by whatever means it was preserved in the location that they found it. That sounded like what they were trying to explain, but doing a very poor job at it. Uh, I think that as far as a tactic goes, whether they are actual biological bodies or something completely reconstructed or artificially made just to present the point, I think that bringing to the attention a physical artifact of a non-terrestrial life form would have the least significant impact on people's immediate psychology and tendency to judge the continuous flow of BS that comes into their minds every single day from social media by by telling us that those were very old bodies and that they'd been here for a long time. It's a totally different kind of story than if we suddenly found a fresh body and did an autopsy on it, right? Nobody's going to believe that, even if it was true. Very few people will believe that. But a lot more people can sit back calmly and consider that these much uh, older, allegedly older bodies, um, that doesn't seem so scary, does it? It's a concept people can live with. And I thought that was a very good tactic on their part to introduce this concept of extraterrestrial life in that specific way will have a minimum psychological impact on people. I, I get, I see what you're saying. Like a st- the softest of disclosures and the, I guess it's like the real question is have these remains like been verified a hundred percent and is like, are they running actual genome tests and like publishing these results to the, uh, scientific and academic communities that, or, with today's or, technology there's absolutely no reason why if they're genuine artifacts their entire sequence shouldn't be fully available to the public in its entirety and be comparable through analysis by other laboratories there is just no reason why not to that technology exists now and networking it is actually built in as a function of most of the software so uh if it doesn't come out, if that information doesn't come out, then I'd be highly skeptical of it. But I would still, I would still agree that it was a great tactic. Right. So it's like, I, I get what you say, right? Just like from a propaganda perspective, too. It's like they're so they're one hundred percent pushing this aliens are real narrative to the public now regardless and now then the next step is are they're going to do these tests or report release uh the scientific data to the scientific community of the world or is it just or is it just more misdirection but doing it in the most psychologically effective manner of manipulation time to tell it could be a distraction or it could be a slow introduction 
yeah, if the story sticks around and uh, we, we hear another story, say, about a month from now of the made publicly available DNA analysis, then assuming it is even DNA, right? It could be something else that we don't know about. Fascinating thought, yeah, possibility, really, right there. And right, like, we best be getting some sample analysis here. If uh, given given high hopes, hopefully not high on hope. Yum. Uh, well, assuming way, that though, it was just a public ploy to basically measure the social response. That's I suppose what I'm thinking. they've got their data now, and if that data supported the concept that the uh, public would totally accept this idea and there will be no major uproar about it and people would be more cordial about discussing the topic, then my guess is if they did have something that they wanted to release and that was the test to find out if the public was ready, it probably passed at this point. And so we might be seeing a follow-up just as a potential prediction uh, which we've seen this kind of thing happen before. That's why I'm predicting it. That uh, we may see a follow up with additional information, and hopefully, it's detailed technical and scientific information. That's what I mean by slow introduction. They want people to get more comfortable with this. They're gauging the reaction. It's like, where is society at now versus way back in the 1940s when they were broadcasting, you know, War of the Worlds on the radio, and everyone thought it was real. <laughs> and there was mass panic. Yeah. So it's a good idea to measure it. I, that's a tactic that I do agree with. It's one that I personally. Thousand year old people. dead aliens are a lot less uh, scary than flying, attacking uh, live aliens, right? Uh, oh, and they, they, they were here to say that years. they worry. were like over 10,000, 15,000 years old. It's like, hey, they, they could be long gone. We don't know. These are really old. Yeah, I believe I heard that it was like a thousand or fifteen hundred. They said, or was it ten thousand? Like, I, I'm still trying to find like the official. If there's like official court, well, well, I guess there's, there's, there's the in the UFO community. Okay, like, so if we can get the official government transcripts of that whole proceeding or whatnot, like, I wanted to point out something though, which. I haven't heard anyone talk about in the discussion of this uh, Mexican Congress alien footage stuff, okay? And that is, assuming the, the fact that they listed an age for these, meaning that they were dated with some radiometric dating method, if they were actually non-terrestrial in origin, they would have completely different isotope ratios. So, so any radiometric dating would be completely useless in trying to figure out how old they were. But nobody bothered to talk about that. If they're not from Earth, they're not going to have the same radioisotope ratios as things that are from Earth that actually make sense to carbon date. Well, carbon date is just a shorthand, but I mean, there are, there are many different isotopes that can be dated. So, but yeah, hopefully they talk about that too. I'd like to hear a bit more technicality instead of just the platitudes. Uh, that's that's what I, have to say. I think it's running simultaneous with also the introduction or you know the disclosure of technologies that they would like society to be familiar with so it's not a sudden shift in people's everyday lives so the entertainment media is slowly disclosing you know it has been for decades uh the technology and now societally speaking they're really playing up with the alien presence and i don't know which to expect first the release of the technology or the introduction of the aliens <laughs> well the release of the technology certainly didn't happen first or we would have it and people have been claiming that they spot a little green men for far longer than the reports of uh you know, actual technologies having been tested and then disappearing. But we can follow the patent records and get a pretty good idea. The stuff has been around for a very long time. It's been around about as long as we've been making patents. I think there might be some pressure 
perhaps on the official powers, or whatever you would like to call them, to TBE. On, yes, keep, keep pace, keep pace with the independent people out there, or they're they're just updating the timeline. They're just uh, I don't know if they're following a timeline or if they're adapting as things evolve. I think there's a little pressure there to be the first to put like their flag on it. Speaking of timelines, this whole concept of reverse entropy and nonlinear timeline curves are very interesting when you talk about being able to screw with the present because it might offer us a not in violation of even Newtonian physics, uh, possibility of having a different outcome from a different observer's point of view in a temporal sense, energetically based on where the energy was in the physical matter surrounding us just by consciously being able to identify and choose that. Now it's a far stretch, but I'm just saying there could be a real mechanism that's explainable in physics today on how we could jump timelines, as some people say, or hop realities, or phase to another reality. I, I, all phase I'm afraid shit. is just about this concept, but... So, yeah, do you go into this bit more? What is the exact geometry and, like, method sort of thing? Is it, like, a phase shift, a slice, a jump, a punch, a hole, a portal... Work okay, so if we ditch the language, I, I, I'm tiles. not going to say that it's any of those things because all of those words drag have, through ether. Yeah, they all have an objective and a subjective meaning. So instead of trying to give it a title that explains it in like a two or three word statement, let's just say that there is a phenomenon in space-time caused by the necessity of balance in the entropic process, where if there is a non-symmetrical exchange of energy in time from a highly energetic system, which happens all the time in nature, uh, then it will actually delay backwards to the point where an observer from one side can see the order of cause and effect completely reversed from an observer on the opposite side or say at 90 degrees to, to the first observer. And these can be physical events that just two people could be sitting in, you know, lounge chairs, almost as if around a campfire, but something really interesting happens at the campfire. And if the concentration is right, what I'm saying here is that it's possible to use the change in the energy relate uh the energy momentum relationship between where the energy is exchanged and actually think your way through it by identifying those subtle little variations where there's a lot of uncertainty and it could have gone either way so it could be intentional unintentional accidental happenstance right it sounds like a type of entanglement it very much is related to entanglement. We still have a lot to learn about quantum entanglement. It has a couple of issues with phase variance in a non-flat space-time or a non-linear uh, temporal field. So there are breakdowns in it, but basically the violations that I just listed are not even considered possible in today's quantum physics. Quantum electrodynamics tries to integrate them, but it really messes it up. And that's why there are so many free and independent theories. I mean, there's so many theories. Everybody pumps out a theory that really gets sucked into this stuff, it seems, with the anti-gravity research and the tapping the zero-point energy field research. So everybody seems to have their own theory, and they really want to talk about it. My idea on it, my theory should be an explanation of how to use it. And I'll try my best to explain how to actually apply it, because that's about as good as a theory is to me. It needs to be experimental. Cool. Oh, really quiet over there, buddy. Looks like you're about to fall asleep, hey, buddy? No, no, I was just uh, letting you uh, give your theory. 
Oh, that's just covering one thing, man. Like, ask a question, I'll give you a thorough. Uh, yeah, if you want to know anything about whatever is within before, my brain. Before we went uh, live, you were describing um, the difference between the Einstein Rosen Bridge uh, wormhole and then this second uh, idea that came to you, good sir. Okay, so let me try to describe uh, the difference. A wormhole is a theoretical concept at this point. We've never found one as far as we can tell for sure. And we've never been able to verify that we've made one, though a lot of the people who work on those high energy pulse projects do think that they observe uh, wormhole activity. It's been done in a quantum nature through entanglement in an almost instantaneous way, but we have yet as far as I know, to actually send matter through one of these things. So the concept of a wormhole is that space can stretch. And you can poke on it a little bit and just imagine it sort of elastic. You can put some pressure on it by changing the uh, energy density of epsilon and mu, primarily in those two, and also from the spin of each node at the uh, Planck structure or at the Planck scale. So imagine the Planck scale is composed of many, many nodes. Imagine it's like a lattice. And each of those points in the lattice has both the properties of a magnetic moment with angular momentum, which has spin, and it has an electric field that surrounds it. And it has a size. And its size is right up to the point where that electric field hits the next point over from it. And each of those bubbles converge and they will interact with each other. So we can add energy into space time without having to put it into matter, which is a really weird idea. But the fact that this energy is actually transmitted between matter through this space time lattice, if just to consider the concept that this lattice might actually exist, then we should be able to look for it. And we should be able to look for evidence that it does exist like, if we put too much energy into it, does it become physical matter again? Does it break apart? Does it have a limit? And it turns out, yeah, it does break when you put too much energy into the vacuum or into the zero-point energy field, as some people would say. It spits out a positron and an electron. Both of those are physical matter. They have real mass, real potential. They have opposite charge with the exact same amplitude. So, yeah, you can break space-time. Now, what happens when they recombine? Well, you get this exit of gamma rays, but gamma rays contain energy. And at that very moment, when they're produced, there's a tiny little variation in the velocity of light at that event. When uh, positron and electron recombine. So, what it tells us is that space-time is breakable. You can mold it. You can press it too hard. And in order to make a wormhole, all we've got to do is just keep on pressing on it until basically we break through. At that point, the field will start to wrap up on itself. It'll self-organize because it's lost all the space to go into. So it's going to create its own new space. So it sounds like packing a lot of power very densely into, like, one area i'm kind of thinking like it's larger it like than makes the inside, a bubble it within the itself. outside like it's exactly. essentially so the whole idea with their with our conventional physics is that it takes a impossible amount of power there's just no way that mankind would ever be able to tap that energy right but then if we think about what happens when you actually do punch through and the self reorientation of all the field lines as it goes into what would be kind of called in Star Trek subspace, well, there's there's a very different set of physics properties there. And if we consider how we might simulate those physics properties in our three-dimensional space where we have our normal physics, which we all know and love, one way that we can do it is by stacking magnetic fields that don't align with each other 